Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of the Short Explanations podcast. My name is Hi. I'm Tom is now in the middle today. I Hi. I think it's because I started the conversation. Anyway, today we, we promised we would never talk about DNS because it's never DNS. It's never, ever, ever, ever DNS. It's never but been today, DNS. But today it's DNS. Yes. Just like every other day, it always ends up being DNS. And before we start, again, uh, I hate to be the YouTube person. Let's, if you're watching us, thank you. Just telling you to support us. Thank you. And we have a signal group. I like to push that forward. It's free. Come join us, message us. We will get you in. With that said, I'm going to ask Tom, what is DNS? Uh, I'm going to show my age here. DNS is the phone book of the internet. Uh, that's probably the, the phrase that has been echoed throughout the ages of what DNS is, how it works. And if you know what a phone book is, you know how DNS works. And if you don't know what a phone book is, well, we're going to tell you. So, again, I, I say the same thing. And for those who don't know what a phone book is, the problem is that we still get phone books. I don't know. Do you still get your phone book? We did in Washington, but we don't in Illinois. Um, it was actually really nice uh, to to completely derail the the conversation the conversation for a little bit um, we had pet rabbits and one of them was super destructive and loved just tearing stuff up so we would hand her a phone book and she would literally just rip pages out and have the the time of her little bunny life just destroying phone books it was great so phone books have had an interesting history so if you don't remember i i live in 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 New Jersey, we had gigantic phone books, like really, really thick phone books, like six, eight, ten inches. That was the idea. If you were short, you had to sit on a booster seat. If you didn't have a booster seat, people would say, just sit on a phone book. These things, and what they did is, now you're going to like, say, you're going to screen privacy. They had everybody's phone number. Literally, everybody's phone number. You went to somebody's phone number, just like when your parents said, when you didn't know how to spell a word, look in the dictionary, you would look in the phone book. And... And then if you got lazy, you would call the operator or you would call then 411, which was uh, 75 cents a minute. And you would tell the operator who you were looking to call and they would give you the number. And if you're like, how is that private? Well, that was called freedom. The freedom of the phone company. And then people said, can we just opt out of phone books? Like in the mid 2000s, like 2005, can we opt out of the phone book? And and there was an actual court case where the phone book company won and said, no, it's freedom. They're allowed to give it to you because they would sell ads. And I guess people still use them. Like, I guess my grandmother like still uses them type thing, but. I don't know. We have internet now. I just, I go, I open, I open a mapping application and I say what I want and I find it. Yeah. You, you could like, just like, you know, uh, Google local pages or a, a local style search on Google will give you like electricians in your area. Uh, it used to be that literally you would just go down the list and be like, oh, hey, Dayton, Ohio, Centerville, Ohio, whatever. Right. You look for electricians and, oh, there was somebody that works as an electrician in the area where you live. And that's, how you found services if you didn't like know a guy or have a neighbor who had some work done and you just wanted to use his person like it was I i'm telling you the the 90s were a lawless wasteland and even before like, that and mostly it was after like that. it's like pre angie's list like you would look in the phone book or pre yeah. yelp reviews but the other part was they had white pages where it had your phone number in there and you would have to pay the phone company a few dollars a month to remove it from the phone book. So they got you both ways. If you didn't do it, they yep. were selling that to the advertisers. And if you paid them, you were you were selling out to the phone company. Um, I actually like phone calls, so I actually don't mind. My students tell me, you're giving us your phone number? And I give them a Google Voice number. I'm like, you're not going to call me, but sure, if you want to call me and say hi, like, what do I care? You're you're so afraid to use the phone. Who really cares? But anyway, anyway, so when we say it's the phone book of the internet, that's literally what it is. You would type in a website, and and I'm jumping a little bit ahead, and it wouldn't know how to route you. And we're gonna take that step back in a second, and the server would have to 
go into what we call the DNS server or the phone book and find out how to route you and it would then do it. And that's essentially what DNS is. Now I'll have Tom backfill literally everything I just said. No, that's actually, that's really good. Yeah. Uh, so like computers, you know, you, you don't just type in google.com and magic happens. So that, a lot of that magic is DNS, right? So you type in google.com, the first thing your computer does, if it hasn't already talked to google.com, if it doesn't have a cached, if it hasn't remembered uh, that IP address of the server you're trying to go to when you typed in at google.com, what it will do is it sends out a DNS request to your configured DNS servers. Now, if you don't remember configuring a DNS server, if you've never configured a DNS server, if things just tend to work, uh, it's because a lot of the time, uh, DNS is going to be just, I would say the majority of the time, it's going to be automatically configured, uh, right? You hook up your cable modem or your DSL modem or your fiber modem or whatever modem, whatever thing connects you to your ISP. Uh, and typically when they hand you, you know, your IP address for your household, they're also handing you uh, a couple DNS servers that they also run on their infrastructure. They're like, okay, well, in, here's here's your IP address. This is who you are on the public internet. Also, um, here's, you know, an area where you can ask our digital phone book what Google.com means and where that maps to. Um, and it's super convenient. Instead of remembering a giant list of IP addresses uh, or a, a giant list of phone numbers, instead we can say, oh, hey, I want to go to Google.com, Facebook, Wikipedia, EFF.org, you know, you name it, it's in DNS. Um, now, not every website has to have a domain, but uh, they're way easier to remember than just, you know, lots and lots of digits of IP addresses. Uh, especially with IPv6, DNS is I, I can't say it's a technical requirement, but it's definitely a human requirement. I think um, I can one. I think I can one up Tom. Turns out, if SSL certificates have DN, the DNS name bound to it, so you cannot go to an SS, a TLS signed website unless you go through DNS. Like you cannot put the IP address in. You can, but only if they've issued that SSL certificate or that TLS certificate for the IP address as well as, or instead of uh, the DNS name, you can get. Uh, at TLS certs based on IP address, believe it or not. They're very rare, but you can get them. Oh, okay. So, because I have stories about that, but yeah. So basically it's, it's, you type something in and for the, and like, like Tom said, if you didn't know what it was, you set up your DNS. Cause the question always was when you manually assigned IP, what was your DNS server? And so I would Google, what is my DNS server? And they would tell you put 192.168.1.1, uh, which meant go to the router and then use the router's DNS, which the router got from your cable modem, which the cable modem Comcast, whomever, uh, runs. And and you went from there. So in unless you had a reason to change it, which we'll get into, you probably just set it, forget it, and never worried about it. And as long as it works, you're okay with that. I mean... Yeah. I have changed mine, and we're going to talk about why you would change it, but for the most part, I would recommend, unless you have a reason to change it, please don't change it. It's probably not worth your time. Yeah, unless you're having an issue, I, you know, you can change it. You might get some slight speed improvements, some slight, slight uh, like DNS resolution improvement timings there, but you don't have to. Um uh, but yeah, so basically how these digital phone books work uh, on the ISP side or any other place that runs a, a open public DNS server that you can just type in some numbers and hook up to uh, is it quite literally takes in that request where you type in google.com, your uh, computer will send out a DNS request and say, hey, uh, I'm looking for www.google.com. Um, can I get the IP address? Can I get the A record? for the thing on this host name for google.com. Um, and if your if that you know phone book on the other side of the request knows it, um, this is what's called a recursive DNS resolver. If they know it, they'll just hand you back the answer. Like, oh, google.com? Yeah, I know that guy. He's cool. Here you go. Here's the IP address. That's how you can connect. And then your computer will just reach out to google.com's IP address directly and make that connection. There's a lot of other steps in there. It can get very complicated, but that's basically how it works. Now, if that digital phone book, let's say in your ISP's infrastructure, doesn't 
know where google.com is right it, it hasn't cached it in a while or the cache value expired or uh something changed or a system rebooted or you know a myriad of different reasons what it can do is it will ask other dns servers so it'll go out to uh kind of its configured next hop and it'll say oh hey um you know it, guy in charge of me like my manager you'll go to its boss and be like oh hey do do you know where Google.com is? Because I don't know where it is, and you know this person's asking for it. I'm I would like to pass along the information, but I don't have it. Uh, and hopefully that server has it. So at the end of this this long chain, because you can get through several different steps where requests are constantly being passed, you know, further and further up the chain to what's called an authoritative DNS server. Um, these are things that run your top-level domain. So anything ending in .com, there's actually a set of .com authoritative DNS servers. So anything that ends in .com is going to be handled by these DNS servers. They know where everything is, and, and they own it. There are some complications there, uh, and I'm glossing over a whole lot of things, in, including like setting different authoritative name servers. You can get really complicated with this stuff if you wanted to. Uh, but typically, you go to an authoritative name server, or eventually a request goes to an authoritative name server, and then uh, it goes back down the chain and you get the answer. But somebody somewhere knows where Google.com is, or they should unless the internet is broken. Uh, then you get the answer and you can go use your search. Which the internet has been broken. We've had that happen. I we remember in, in October, I think October 2016, uh, so the Mirai botnet took out Dyne DNS, which apparently served 30% of the internet, and everything was down because that that author Dyne DNS allegedly was an authoritarian DNS and took out like the East Coast, I think something like that. You can so. do some really cool tricks with DNS. So depending on who you ask or where you're coming from, a DNS server can can do some cool things like, oh hey, well. If this person's asking me, then they're probably in like, like, especially for an ISP, right? Well, if they're asking this DNS server, they're probably in like this geographic location. So when they're asking for Google.com, well, I could give them a bunch of different Google.com. So all over the world, right? There's a bunch of different uh, IP addresses that'll map to Google.com. Let's give them the one that's closest to them. Uh, and you can do things like actually serve content physically closer to your users just through um, you know, geography-based DNS, uh, which sounds really complicated, but it's not overly complex and super helpful when you're trying to download stuff fast or uh, watch a Netflix video without it buffering the whole time. So can, you, can we get the BBC DNS? Uh, you can, yeah. You can definitely use the, the UK's DNS servers. Now, I, it's probably not going to help you watch BBC for free. Uh, you're going to need some extra stuff other than just changing DNS. Um, but it would start serving you things from the UK if, if the sites are using that type of geo-based DNS. Um, so, downsides about DNS. It was it was quite literally like most things in the early internet and early computing. It was built to function. It wasn't necessarily built to be secure. It wasn't built with privacy in mind. And that's that's not to you know I, knock the the old graybeards who made the internet function or anything like that. We just we it was literally an issue of we don't know what we don't know, uh, and security, privacy, and expectations are a constantly moving target throughout human history. But um, what this means is that DNS requests are in plain text. When you say, when you ask your ISP, hey, could I you know, get the address to google.com, anyone along that path, any router, any system, any, uh, any a network device that's in the path passing that message along, it's all in plain text. They can see, oh, hey, Tom wants to know where Google.com is. And, you know, that's a really boring request. But uh, if all of a sudden you see a request of, hey, Tom wants to know where, uh, where WikiLeaks is, that could be a little more interesting. Or any other site that you want to substitute here, right? Like, oh, Tom's looking at allrecipes.com. He's probably cooking dinner tonight. Uh, and you can make some inferences based on that. So if you ever wonder why companies like Google 
are offering free DNS servers that anyone can hook up to, it's because they're doing data mining on the requests. I, are we allowed to say that? I don't know if that's true. I'm assuming it's true. I don't know why Google would operate a DNS server otherwise. I, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just, so, we just don't know, but we can, inf right. we can infer that why wouldn't they do that? Yeah, I, I am going to, uh, going to totally put on my, my speculation hat and say, yeah, that's, that's my guess. Purely a guess. Uh, and you know, if I'm wrong, definitely tell me, put it in the signal group. Let's talk about it. And, uh, in the next episode, we'll have a correction. Um, but, you know, through uh, modern pushes for better protocols, safer protocols, more private protocols, uh, DNS has been kind of in the crosshairs for a while as, you know, really wanting some of these good upgrades. Um, and so there have been a myriad of different projects and uh, uh, protocol uh, specifications and RFCs uh, designed to try to modernize DNS or at least shove the insecure DNS system as it is right now inside of a more secure container, uh, which is uh, what will lead us to kind of the most modern implementation of a safer DNS. It's still not well, perfect, let, but it's better. Let, let me ask you two questions before that. So if I go to a website that doesn't exist, whatever, and you know when you go to a website that doesn't exist, it comes back and it says, hey, it gives you an ad page of things that, that you typed in. I feel like that is your ISP getting that DNS request and then trying to put ad, insert ads over there to whatever, try and get you to click or make money or whatever it is. Monetizing so, the 404. Okay. So, oh, so we have a name for it. So yes. <laughs> so there's your Comcast. I just made it up. Oh, okay. That there's your Comcast or your ISP doing something to monetize it. Because remember, your ISP is usually hosting the DNS. So, and I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're selling it. The question was, was Google selling it? I'm sure Verizon and Optimum and Comcast and all of them are absolutely selling the DNS requests, which leads us to the second question. Well, so we have that to talk about. That's going to be next. The other one is just like in the phone book, can you spoof DNS? Can we say, hey, can we change somebody's phone number? Like, can we grab all the phone books and or just call up the company and say, oh, you made a mistake on our phone number. There's a typo. It's really this number. And then grab that and then use it as a scam attack. When you say, hey, I want to go to paypal.com and it and it redirects you to not paypal.com. Yes. So this is called DNS poisoning. Uh, and there's I'm going to avoid getting into the specifics of exactly how DNS poisoning works, because there are a myriad of different ways to poison uh, DNS responses. Uh, but yes, let's say that if you if that some malicious actor were in the middle of your connection between uh, you and whatever DNS server you're talking to. If you're using classic plain old DNS, not only is your request in plain text, but that response is in plain text. More importantly, in classic DNS, um, there's no checksumming, authentication, uh, you know, kind of message digest code, nothing like that. So if somebody says, oh, uh, PayPal.com, yeah, they put on their evil hat and they change it to, you know, their not PayPal scam website. They'd be like, yeah, yeah, PayPal's over here at this IP address. You should definitely go there and make sure you put in your two-factor code very quickly because, you know, I got stuff to buy. Um, then, yeah, you can absolutely... Uh, hijack DNS responses and send people to places where they didn't necessarily want to go. Uh, and that can be super dangerous. Now, luckily, in, in the modern era, that's not such a huge problem. And I've actually used DNS poisoning as uh, it, troubleshooting uh, in corporate environments. It's actually been super helpful. Um, not to, like, scam people, but to say, oh, hey, the server's over here. Can I intercept the request and actually see what's going on? It's cool. We can talk about it in the signal group. But um, through TLS, uh, you know, somebody might be able to say, oh, hey, yeah, PayPal.com is definitely over here. And this isn't, you know, evilsite.org. Um, but 
when you do that certificate validation and you go, oh, hey, um, I know PayPal.com is issued by this certificate authority. Uh, I know it's going to, you know, normalize and rationalize to this uh, encryption hash, and and we're we're going to have this signature and this fingerprint, and you do all your cool standard TLS uh, certificate validation steps. The person running the evil website isn't necessarily going to have a valid certificate to PayPal.com, so they can say, oh yeah, this is totally PayPal but you're going to get that big red scary screen that pops up and it goes, whoa, there's something wrong with this certificate. You're probably not where you think you are. So TLS offers kind of this belt and suspenders, even if somebody is poisoning your DNS, as long as the sites you're visiting are HTTPS, you're decently well protected. At the very least, you should know if something shady is really going on. Um, I'm sure there are advanced attacks out there to try to work around this stuff. Uh, it's literally people's jobs to try to hack people uh, and get around these compensating controls. But for the average person out there, uh, TLS is going to protect you even if DNS gets hijacked. So, I mean, that was the first thing that I, that we did hear about. And I think the second thing that we should talk about, and I think that's within the show notes, are the advertising against it, the the privacy aspects of it. So... So I forgot what you just called it, but you go to uh, weapon advertising the 404. Uh, we're going, you type something in wrong, you get an advertisement. How did that advertisement come about? Who is selling that stuff? Is there a way to hide where you're searching so that metadata that we're searching for doesn't get out there and for better or worse, uh, show bad things or good things that you're doing? So I, I personally like even even discounting ads even if it's just a plain search box that shows you a list of results when i mistype a dns name i want it to come back with nothing i want right. i want that really sad chrome dinosaur to pop up and be like ah oh, sorry man there's nothing here like that's great um so if you want to get rid of that this might be a reason to change away from those isp dns servers um, even something, if you wanted to change to Google's DNS servers, Google doesn't give you those search pages, um, right? It'll it'll tell you there's nothing here and your computer will behave appropriately. Um, so, yeah, that's that's more of like an implementation detail than anything else. There's still a privacy aspect to it, but it's more of a, like user nicety preference feature more than anything else. It's one of those, I mean, I'm waiting at the end where we give people our suggestions on DNS. So I'm waiting for you to tell me the other stuff before we talk yeah. about that. So, um, Mozilla, uh, the, the, you know, creators and, uh, and stewards of the Firefox web browser, um, actually pushed out some changes, I want to say in 2020, it, it was fairly recently, in the past five or six years, um, where they actually moved all of their browser's uh, DNS systems uh, to use DNS over HTTPS. Uh, and what this means is that, unfortunately, you can't just, like, slap it into any old... DNS system, right? Like you, you can't usually uh, can't go to uh, like an older router's firmware and say, oh, hey, this thing is running DNS over HTTPS. Just make it work. They're very different protocols and they work differently. But what this basically means is quite literally what it sounds like. You take a DNS request, you shove it into a standard HTTPS request, and then you're able to use, uh, you know, TLS over HTTPS or a TL a HTTP over TLS, also known as HTTPS to send your DNS requests off to a server. Um, now, this does protect you from those snooping people in the middle between you and that first server you talk to, right? Because if, if you're sending your DNS request through an encrypted TLS tunnel through HTTPS, um, then there's not really a great way to get in the middle of that, not without some super cool hacking techniques, which you shouldn't worry about as an average person. Um, but those upstream servers, where if that first server doesn't know the answer and it's got to go up 
the chain and talk to you know other recursive resolvers and eventually to the authoritarian or authoritative name server those aren't really protected so like you can still have people in the middle there like uh, scarfing data or doing analysis even the server you're talking to for your dns over https could be doing that data collection so it's not an end-to-end -end encrypted protocol and i want to be very clear there it's it's not protecting against every bad thing that could happen it's really taking care of that first hop problem and uh more often than not it's taking care of the problem where something like um a corporate firewall is doing weird things to dns and intercepting things and, and changing answers around or outright blocking content uh, instead you're masquerading dns to make it look like https traffic and just sending it out the pipe unless uh you know whatever enterprise environment you're in is actually breaking open uh tls traffic and https traffic to do inspection it basically means that your dns request out uh over HTTPS are going to be largely untouched and unmessed with okay i mean it's so the i so do do we tell people to move to to uh dns over https or do we tell them just to stick with their whatever at home whatever it is because it's just so easy and not and we really don't need to worry about all of this Unless you have a problem with DNS, I don't think you have to touch it. If you are concerned about privacy, if you don't want, uh, you know, anyone in the middle doing that data analysis like your ISP, then yeah, DNS over HTTPS is fine. If you're using Firefox, congratulations, you're already on DNS over HTTPS. Uh, Chrome has this built in too. Uh, I don't believe Chrome has it on by default. I mean, I need to crack open Chrome and dig through the settings to to verify that, but I don't think they use DOH by default, um, but Firefox does. Uh, Chrome has the ability, and even uh, Windows 10 and Windows 11 have support on the operating system level for DNS over HTTPS. The downside to this entire scheme, though, is it requires out-of-band configuration. Uh, and what that means is that, you know, for your standard DNS system, you're going to get it when you do the DHCP request to get an IP address from whatever ISP you've got or router, whatever, right? You're, you're going to get not only an IP address, but you're going to get a collection of DNS servers for you to reach out to. A DNS over HTTPS does require, you know, some pre-setup. You have to know who you're talking to. You have to have that IP address. Um, you're not necessarily going to get that. Uh, in a classic DHCP request, you can. DHCP is very extendable, but most of the time it's not going to work like that. Um, more importantly, you have to you know, have a certificate store and you have to be able to validate those requests to make sure you are talking to the right person you think you're talking to or the right system you think you're talking to. Um, so it does require some out-of-band setup. How Firefox gets around this is quite literally when it comes to an update uh, or like a, a Firefox update that made this thing default, it came with a lot of those DNS over HTTPS servers already pre-configured. And you do have a choice of them, right? There's like Cloudflare and Google and Quad9 and there's uh, a couple other ones pre-configured in there, but it's got the certificates preloaded. Uh, it's got all the IP addresses preloaded. It knows how to interface with those. So it's just gonna work out of the box when it comes to that application. If you're trying to retrofit something classic or something that doesn't necessarily speak DNS over HTTPS, you'll have to find a, a more clever solution. So I, I guess the final result is, unless you're having a problem, these peop the people are saying, oh, go on this DNS, it's much faster. It's not much faster. Unless you're actively having a problem, don't listen to people telling you to move to, move to this DNS or that one, unless you know exactly what you're doing. Um, it, it's, I think I'm running quad, I think I'm running Cloudflare's DNS only because they, they claim to be doing it right or whatever it is, but that's just because I know what I'm doing. Uh, I think I have quad nine as the secondary one. I had open DNS for a while. Open DNS allowed you to block things. So if you wanted to block certain certain malicious domains or adult content or social media there's things there but again they got bought out i think they got bought out by cisco and i yep. said eh, 
eh, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go somewhere else. Cause I mean, I do care about the privacy aspect. However, when things happen, it's one of those things. So the running joke is it's never DNS. It's as you move around, something happens and you have to remember that, that that's another layer on your network that can cause problems. And if you're changing it, you have to remember that you changed it. Whereas if you're using your ISP's DNS, there's probably very little you have to worry about and, and you can take that out. But on the other hand, like we said, it's, it's you're giving some information to your ISP if they're using that, which we're not sure of. So here's kind of the, the privacy thought process that I go through. So when, when I was back using Comcast, right, I was using, uh, I think it was Quad not, or, uh, Cloudflare and Google for my DNS providers. Um, right, I, I had heard kind of bad things about Comcast DNS just over the years. Right, nothing sustained, nothing crazy, but they have had outages before. Most ISPs have had DNS outages at some point in time, uh, and I figured that Google would have less outages, so I went that way. Cloudflare will have less outages, so sure, add them on too. If one of those two have problems, I'll just go to the other. One. Um, but you have to remember that all of this is still flowing through your ISP, and DNS is still plain text. So even if you're asking Google or Cloudflare or whoever your DNS provider is, your ISP could still see those messages. If they're doing that traffic inspection, and chances are they probably are, um, then yeah, they're going to still see what you're asking for. They're going to still see what you're browsing to. And anyway, they're your ISP. All of the bits that you ask for have to flow through their pipes anyway. So you know, how much protection is there really when it comes to protecting DNS traffic? Um, so if you wanted to, you know, not go right to the source and make your ISP do a little bit extra work to take your data, yeah, you could do that. And for me, that just kind of made sense. And the uh, minimal speed benefit I got from using Google's DNS over Comcast's own was fine. I said it once, I forgot about it, and it stayed that way forever until I rebuilt my network earlier this year. Um, so there, there are other systems like DOT, which is DNS over TLS. And if, if you've paid attention, you know how these things work. You know, what, what really is the difference between DNS over HTTPS and DNS over TLS? I mean, HTTPS is using TLS, so why are there two of them? Uh, and the answer is quite literally uh, corporate management and a port number. That's it. So DNS over HTTPS looks like just plain old HTTPS traffic. And unless somebody is you know, willing to intercept that traffic and then install certificates everywhere and uh, you know, do, do a whole bunch of work to crack open HTTPS traffic and inspect it, um, DNS is going to flow through completely unencumbered. Uh, right? Your, your uh, blocking systems, if you're blocking you know, adult content, at an enterprise, well, guess what? DNS over HTTPS gets around your compensating controls. It gets around those blocks because you're not cracking that open, you're not inspecting that data, and so people are just going to get whatever they ask for. Um, DNS over TLS is different. It actually runs on a specific port, uh, and it allows enterprise clients to outright block it or uh, force that traffic onto enterprise managed boxes where they run the phone book and they determine what's a pr an appropriate IP address for you to resolve and what's not. Um, so most of the industry, I would say, is moving towards DNS over HTTPS. Um, DNS over TLS is an option, but honestly, I can see it going away. DNS crypt is something entirely different, and I think we can talk about it in a different episode. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, uh, what DNS Crypt uh, is mostly concerned with is making sure that the answers you get back haven't been tampered. It's essentially message authentication. It's making sure that when you ask for google.com, this IP address is google.com. And by the way, here's the cryptographic signature that you can verify we've given you the proper information. Cool. Solves very different problems still cool and and it's time for another episode so that's <laughs> that's for a different episode where we have where we talk about cryptography and i have one more thing and it's quick okay. i promise 
no matter what you pick, no matter what technology you pick, no matter who you pick for your DNS provider, and there are several out there, the one thing you absolutely have to keep in mind is that the server you configure and the people you are asking uh, for answers to, you know, who has Google.com right now, what IP address is Google.com right now, those people are the ones you have to trust. So if you really 100% do not trust Google no matter what, don't use Google's DNS. I know that sounds really straightforward, but you, you have to think about it that way, right? The, the DNS provider that you pick, you're literally trusting them not only with giving you the right answer to your, your DNS queries, but you're also trusting them with the data you're handing them. And the data is, hello, I'm this person at this or these machines at this IP address, and I'm asking for these domains. That can either be the most boring data in the world, where there's like a handful of Google and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, or it can be, you know, super impressive, super interesting data, depending on your browsing habits. Whoever you pick, make sure you trust them. There you go. Trust us. We only bring you the best information. With that said, we're going to call it a night. It's actually, it's actually daylight right now, but we're going to call it a night, and we will hopefully see you next week. If not, join our Signal group. Come talk to us. We're there all the time. With that said, everyone have a good night, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. See ya.